Okay, well, thank you, everybody, and um, especially thank you to Leah and to all of the speakers this morning for a really lively and terrific session. So um, the morning session was intended to be about um, open access for research articles, but as you saw, um, the article and, and data questions are, are frankly really intertwined. And so we did have some really good discussion about data and data considerations this morning. So we're going to follow up on that in this session, and we're going to talk about um, how the open science mandate creates opportunities for better data archiving and for better science stemming from better data archiving. And uh, we're very fortunate to be kicking off with a talk from Bob Hanish, who is the Director of the Office of Data and Informatics Material Measurement Laboratory at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And this next sentence says, he is responsible for improving data management and analysis practices and helping to assure compliance with national directives on open data access. And you notice it doesn't say at NIST. And that's because if you operate in the data space, you know that he's responsible for all that in the world at large. Um, you know, Bob is uh, just ubiquitous all over the the data space, and and you know, as I said, he's he's just he's an evangelist, and he is an organizer, and he is really just vital to to this whole endeavor. Um, prior to coming to NIST in 2014, he was the senior scientist at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore and was the director of the U.S. Virtual Astronomical Observatory. For more than 25 years, Dr. Hanish led efforts in the astronomy community to improve the accessibility and interoperability of data archives and catalogs. So please join me in welcoming him. Well, Jake, I don't know if I can match that introduction, but I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to talk about fair data repositories, expectations, obligations, and expenses. And uh, as I said earlier in some of my questions, um, my colleague Brian from uh, from DOE is always extremely careful in the way he words things. And I'm going to be deliberately uncareful because I'm close to retirement, and if I get in trouble, I don't care. <laughs> <clears throat> You all know about FAIR. I don't need to explain that acronym in this room, I don't think. Expectations. We've already heard today, Miriam set up the scenario this morning uh, with the Holdren memo from 2013. I also interjected here sort of a chronography. The FAIR principles came out in 2016. Um, in uh, 2022, the Subcommittee on Open Science published this white paper on desirable characteristics of data repositories for federal funded research, and then, of course, the Nelson memo that we heard about earlier today in 2022. Um, another important uh, expectation, which flies below the radar, is an annotation of measurements with their units of measurement. Um, this is an area that is ripe for improvement. If you don't do this right, you will never have machine actionable uh, uh, data. Um, there are numerous accounts of huge mistakes that have been made in the aerospace industry, for example, because units were not properly annotated, assumptions were made about units that were incorrect, and you know, a mission to Mars failed because uh, units were doubly converted when they didn't have to be. So um, I led a paper uh, a year and a half ago or so, Stop Squandering Data, Make Units of Measurement Machine Readable. It was an opinion piece published in Nature. And this really is something that all of us uh, who are involved in taking data, annotating data, need to be aware of, that if we don't get the units into the measurements, you'll never be able to have machines uh, understand how to compare those data sets correctly. Obligations. Uh, again, we've heard about the requirements on data management plans, data management and sharing plans. The obligation I see as somebody who works at the infrastructure development level is on assuring that data are born fair. You don't want scientists to bear the burden of annotating their data by hand. For one, if they do it, which they usually don't, if they do it, they will do it poorly. They're not interested in this. It's a waste of their time. 
So we need to make sure that data are born fair and are born fair through automation. Laboratory information management systems, electronic laboratory notebooks, any of our technologies that can extract data automatically from a machine from, or from a computer simulation are what is really key to doing this right. You need to understand, have data models, metadata standards. Increasingly, we run into problems with vendors who uh, sell you an instrument and the data is in a proprietary binary format. This is sacrilege to me because um, in terms of the transparency and reliability of research data, we as researchers need to understand what's going on inside that machine. Um, of course, vendors want to sell you not just a piece of hardware, they want to sell you a whole software stack. But this is counter to me, in my mind, to the good practice of science, which relies on transparency uh, uh, in the whole process. Um, fair digital objects is an emerging technology that uh, is being talked a lot about a lot now. There's a conference coming up next month in Berlin about FDOs. I'm on the steering committee for this activity. And this is a, an idea that you can take any digital information and wrap it in metadata with appropriate PIDs, the persistence identifiers, such that this is a machine actionable piece of information. And you can build FDOs of FDOs of FDOs. So you can have sort of a hierarchical construct, all of which becomes machine, not only machine read, readable, but machine actionable. So this is a really important piece of, again, leveraging on us as infrastructure uh, providers to make sure that we make our data uh, most widely accessible and reusable as possible through technologies like this. I mentioned the units of measurement interoperability service. A colleague of mine, Stuart Chalk, has been developing with support from, from us at NIST. This is a toolkit, again, that allows researchers to um, encode the units with their data properly using an established uh, metadata encoding scheme. And if you have data that is represented in one encoding scheme, you can translate it to another without any loss of information, without any mistakes in scaling. It links automatically to the fundamental constants. NIST is the custodian along of the CoData fundamental constants. These are things like the Planck constant and the electron mass and so forth. All of that information forms the SI system, the International System of Units of Measurement. So if you, a big thing for us in metrology is traceability. I make a measurement, is calibrated against something else, which is calibrated with something else again. That whole traceability chain is fundamental in measurement science. And services like this are key to making that work um, in a, in a dynamic uh, computer oriented way. And of course, it would be remiss of me not to mention the research data framework. This came up this morning, again, in Miriam's talk. This is a, a document and a website that we have been developing now for over four years at NIST uh, that basically is a guide to the research data ecosystem. Uh, there are six major data life cycles. There are uh, roles and responsibilities of different individuals in the research data ecosystem, whether you're a, a bench scientist or whether you're a librarian or whether you are a funder, uh, if you are a dean of faculty, all of these people have roles and responsibilities in research data management in the research data ecosystem. It is not a standard. It is not even a guideline. It's a tool to help people assess their uh, capabilities and to improve and to decide where the most important areas are to invest their, their resources. Obligations, slide two. Um, federal agencies in the US supported $54 billion in university-based research in 2022. That's a lot of money, 54 billion. I could have a nice vacation home in Spain for that. <laughs> I estimate that about 10% of that gross budget supports research publication costs, uh, art, article processing charges, subscriptions. I base this on the fact that Elsevier income in 2022 was 3 billion euros. The STM Association estimates the journal market value of $10 billion. So this is, this is an astronomical estimate. So it's an order of magnitude sort of thing, but roughly 10%. 
of that research budget goes into assuring that the research results are published. Data are an essential component of that research record. We need the data to assure re reproducibility, reliability, these R words, um, also the T words, transparency and trust. And of course, open source software is like data. It's not exactly the same as data, but it's part of the process by which people reach scientific conclusions based on the data that they are looking at. So all of this has to be visible as part of the research record. Quality data are also the fodder for artificial intelligence. Garbage in, garbage out. It's been part of the mantra of computers for the past 50 years. And we see this now in large language models that are trained on garbage information. They give you garbage conclusions, right? They come up with nonsense. They come up with you know, hallucinations. So again, the onus is on, on us as people, myself as somebody who helps to build infrastructure to aid uh, scientific research to assure that we have the best quality information feeding into the system and it's done as automatically as possible, taking the human error system, error propensity out of the equation. And this is really, in terms of obligation, the thing I wanna drive home Funders should be compelled to set aside long-term support for data repositories. I see it as nothing short of a moral obligation. With $54 billion going into basic research in universities, the fact that there's no assurance that the outcome of that research is preserved in perpetuity, to me, is simply, um, what's the right word? It's just reprehensible. I think we have to change our thinking about this. The onus is indeed, in my view, on the funders to make sure not only that the interpretation of the data gets out in papers, but that the data themselves and the tools that were used to reach those conclusions also get out and are preserved for posterity. Expenses. How many times have I heard that data curation and preservation is too expensive? I don't know, every month I hear that. It's not true. It is not true. I worked for 35 years in astronomy where data curation and preservation has become, has, has been part of the, the fabric of astronomy now for three decades. And I've done a pretty thorough survey of the expenses of data management in astronomy. And it varies between one and 10% and of the uh, annual operating budget of a major telescope. 10% gets you highly calibrated, highly cult or curated data. 1% saves the data off the instrument. Somewhere in there is a sweet spot, right? Um, at NIST, we, <laughs> we live on a shoestring and we have implemented our public data repository for 0.1% of our annual operating budget. Now we do not a terribly thorough job on all of our research data in terms of curation, but at least we're saving it. And we're saving it sometimes even in those vendor proprietary formats because we don't have a, uh, an open alternative, but at least we're saving it. But we did that for less than, or for about 0.1% of our annual research budget. So my proposal is that we should set aside in our major public funders two to 3% of the federal research budget, and we would solve this problem. This is not a technical problem. We know how to store data. We know how to annotate data. We know how to transfer data from one medium to another. We know how to figure out the costs in terms of cloud versus on-premise. We know all this. This is not a technical problem. It's a social engineering problem. We need the commitment to do it. And the community, needs to start net knocking on the doors at NSF and NIH and DOE and say, we demand this. Because if we don't do this, we're, we're squandering our resources for future research. This data can be reused and repurposed for a fraction of the cost that it took to acquire it in the first place. In astronomy, the, I worked on the Hubble Space Telescope data archive for many years. That data is used 
three times more frequently by researchers who had nothing to do with acquiring it in the first place. This is a huge return on investment. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the, the, uh, the team wrote, I don't know, a few hundred research papers. The community wrote 6,000 research papers using that data. When you have data that is well curated, well annotated, well characterized with metadata, it will be reused and it will be recombined in ways that were not imagined by the people who took the data in the first place. So for two or 3% of this gross budget, you will get a return on investment, which I predict will be 50, 100%, 200% of the cost that you put in this. This can be done by setting up a network of domain specific research repositories. They can be recompeted on a three, five year basis so that you're getting the best return, the best quality in that data curation. Um, we don't want to see 5,000 data repositories with non-interoperable metadata standards. This would be a disaster, but we do have to recognize that data curation does have specificities that depend on the research domain. And even in astronomy, maintaining X-ray data is different than maintaining radio data. The techniques of observing are different. The nose, noise characteristics are different. And so we divide the data up and cut in terms of the wavelength spectrum. In different research domains, that will be divided up in different ways. But, um, but this can be done. And the fact that I've been arguing for this for 20, 30 years, you know, my head is pretty sore from banging it against the wall. And I, I, but I, I keep doing it because I think it is so important. Um, and, and there's no reason that we can't do it. So end of my evangelizing, <laughs> as, as, uh, as I said I would do, um, that's my story. And I hope that you as a community in chemistry will also help drive this, this message through that we need to do this and it's shameful if we don't. Thank you. The QR code should take you there. Oh, yeah. And if it doesn't work, just Google. If people want to photograph the slide, I think it's a terrific resource. Okay, great. Perfect. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, um, next up we have uh, Professor Olaf Feast, who is the Grace Rupley Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of Notre Dame, where he has spent um, the lion's share of his career after uh, training at the University of Bonn and then uh, at UCLA. And he is also a Camille Dreyfus Teacher Scholar, a fellow of the AAAS, and held visiting appointments at UCSF, DFCI, HCUST, and PKUSZ. And um, in addition, he directs the NSF Center for Computer Assisted Synthesis and was an associate editor for Journal of Organic Chemistry until 2021. His research focuses on the elucidation of mechanisms using electronic structure theory, data chemistry, and machine learning, and the development of synergistic predictive methods in synthetic organic chemistry that combine the QTMM method he co-developed with experimental studies. The mechanistic insights and design principles derived from these studies are then applied to projects in computational biophysics and drug design for the treatment of infectious and rare diseases, specifically neiman pick type C, where his work formed the basis of a clinical trial. And um, I just want to emphasize that he is a particular go-to if you need somebody to look at a study that combines computational and experimental chemistry. He, he just has a a keen eye and a deeply analytical perspective on those questions. And um, that's what he's going to tell us about today in his um, intriguingly titled talk, Fairies, F-A-I-R, Ghosts and Trolls, Data Challenges in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. Thanks, Jake. Um... So we 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 moving on here from uh, 
you know, people in the federal government to people, you know, tenured faculty members. So it's going to get a little wilder. I can can uh, probably be even more opinionated, which I probably would be anyway. Um, so so this is in a bit of a of a view from the trenches, if you will. Um, as somebody as a researcher and and um, working in in this area of uh, computer synthesis in the center where when we started back in 2019 a lot of the stuff that we're currently confronted with didn't really exist in that form and so um that got kind of dropped into our lab and, and we're trying to figure it out so um let me see this work so uh, again the the idea of fair data uh, has been around in that form since about 2016 actually the original ideas go uh, much further back to about 2007, I think it was. Um, and then about two years ago or three years ago, AI happened, or so are we told. And so one of the issues that got, um, as we started up CCAS, uh, came to the forefront, even though that wasn't really planned, is how do we deal with the data on that? And I do want to share a few things, uh, how we address that. I don't claim to have all the answers for that one. Um, but I also think we have a lot of new tools that might help us some of these problems. So um, I'm really looking forward actually to the next speaker because if it comes to the sustainability issues, then I think the PDB um, told us a lot about how to do this. And I think the key point here, in my opinion is value. If you can demonstrate value people will figure out how to fund it. And so I'm really looking forward to your presentation. In the context of AI, uh, one of the things that has been mentioned a few times now is the question of quality, data quality. And I think that becomes a lot more important. And at least in my definition of quality, it means trustworthy and transparent. Where does the data come from? And getting, um, getting to original data back there the curation of this data, putting it into context, taking out some of this noise and, and things that are frankly wrong. Um, getting a concept around how uncertain things are, you know, a, a number or a data point is not just a number, there is a range around it and that matters, okay? And then how complete, what are we missing? How consistent is it internally? Because one of the beautiful things about looking particularly at the original data is that if there's a problem and you start thinking in the context of consistency, you will figure it out, okay? Um, and so how do we get this data? I think the, the concept uh, that is important here that we at least talk a lot about within CCAS is the question of pre-competitive. In other words, things that is of value for everybody, but doesn't necessarily rise to questions of IP and such. So we need to, in the context of value, we need to make sure that people see value in depositing the data and using the data. Um, and so we, in our job is partially making that as, as easy and, and painless as possible. Um, and that goes back to some of the things that were uh, here just a second ago, how do we uh, automate that? Um, getting the right data. So this is um, this is my bit of evangelizing right now. Um, uh, coming from the University of Notre Dame, you do a bit of that. Um, the idea of getting the right data. We haven't, I think, thought enough about what is the right data that we really should do. And um, so here's an example of that. Uh, this is for in case you care, uh, case you care about it, is the Woodward Huff, um, uh, the Buford Hartwig reaction. If you're the blue points in the high throughput experimentation, if that is the data set you have, but you want to get the products that are in yellow, your predictive model is going to be awful, right? So the idea of getting the data set design right, something we also talked about about lunch. Uh, in getting the right data with the right coverage needs to be part of that conversation. All right, so what are really the challenges that I see in this area? Um, and so 
we got the fairy. So uh, one of the big challenges are the ghosts. Okay, and what I mean with this, so this is a definition of ghosts based from the wiki. And so they're invisible presence, sometimes translucent, sometimes they're real. And that's a way I look at data in a say, there is real explicit data, but very often it's implicit or even inferred. And then how do you, how do you deal this? How do you draw this out, uh, this data? And this is true across all the major data sources that I think about. So all the legacy data, the publications, all the databases that are built on these publications, um, uh, the, all the electronic lab notebooks uh, that are out there with the original data, and then uh, in last maybe decade or so, high throughput experimentation data. All of those have inferred implicit uh, data in there. How do we make it explicit? Because that's what you need. And so, um, so one of the, the questions that came up uh, earlier today was a question of negative data. This is an example for this in saying what is negative data because it can be your experiment didn't give you the product. Well, they didn't, what did happen? Every one of us who works in academia, the first thing we would ask is for a student that said the reaction didn't happen. Well, what did happen? Did you drop the flask? Did you, you know, starting material, something else? What happened? You have to infer this data and need to get it out. The second big challenge that I see are what I call trolls. So again, Wiki is helpful there, ugly, slow-witted, really helpful, even dangerous to, to human beings. That is about as good as a definition that I can think of for an electronic lab notebook. Um, so here's a wonderful study from Nature Protocols uh, two years or a year and a half ago. It looked at 172 electronic lab notebooks um, that basically pointed out all of these problems. A lot of them are you know, discontinued, um, they're proprietary, that was an issue, they're not interoperable, they go away. Um, but at the same time, this is really where the data is. An industry more than in academia, because in industry it's it's there and, and you know there's no discussion about it. But this is, can we get the data out there is gonna be one of the big problems. Uh, despite the fact, again, this is inconsistent, incomplete, contradictory, it's a hot mess. And I worked myself enough in industry to actually see some of this data and it's horrible. Um, so how do we get this out? Um, this is where I wanna talk a little bit about the work that we do at uh, CCAS. A uh, little bit in case you're not familiar with the program, uh, CCAS is a phase two NSF Center for Chemical Innovations. So this is kind of the flagship program of the chemistry division. Uh, we started out with a smaller part back in 2019. Since uh, November, uh, since uh, September 22, we're in phase two, uh, which is a five-year, $20 million project, um, renewable one. So we're probably looking at about a 10-year or so time frame. And we have been for very fortunate uh, in getting quite a bit of buy-in from industry uh, for the idea is to really change the way chemistry is done. Uh, how do you discover chemistry, optimize them, uh, figure things out, this whole idea of what we call data chemistry. I'm gonna talk about that more in a, in a minute. And this is something where industry really made the, you know, they're basically, this is a done deal as far as they're concerned. This is the future. And uh, so we work with a lot of the companies here. We work with the community to really, how do we implement data chemistry? What do I mean? And if you want to know more about this, there's um, some websites and things like it. So what do I mean with, with data chemistry? It's the idea that data is really the foundation of what we do, data streams, combined with the representation of molecules and the correct algorithms, that is really a new way of doing the chemistry, but the data is the foundation. And that's why we care about it so much. Once you have this, then you can do things in uh, the, the databases, molecular representation, and I'm not gonna talk about the uh, algorithms today, but there's new machine learning algorithms that you have to develop. 
those will be the things that allow you to address the things that we care about as chemists, you know, optimizations and synthesis and uh, reaction predictions in a novel and much more efficient way. And so um, we have put out a few uh, of the results already um, in the optimization, the Bayesian optimizer, uh, retrosynthesis programs, the co-scientists. And that's one of the things that CCAS is strongly committed to. Everything goes out, everything is free. Okay, nothing is propriety, source code, everything goes out. All right, one of these things that is pertinent to the discussion today is the uh, open reaction database, where it's really the, the data for things that we care about, organic synthesis goes out um, in a form that's freely available to everybody and it's easily um, readable. Uh, the idea again being that it goes into machine learning products, um, interacts with people, controls robots. And so just as an example of what's out there right now, there's approximately three and a half million data sets, uh, data points in this database right now. Um, we also were fortunate enough to get some funding from Schmidt Futures on this. Um, Connor Coley has been the leading the effort on that one. Uh, and if you want to know more about it, here is the, the data set itself. And of course, uh, the publication that goes with it. Uh, this is roughly what it looks like. Um, and this is a lot of thought went into the design of that in terms of the idea of getting away from um, prioritizing the data itself over the format. Um, again, the problem of, of priority data make it easy to bring data in. And this is something that we're currently working on, the automated curation. I'm gonna show you something like uh, in a second there and that it's easy to get out. But everybody, if you feel so inclined and you wanna download the whole thing, be our guest, okay? It's all out there. Um, so how do we get this automated curation? And that is actually, I think, uh, Elen said that earlier, really a, a game changer, something that has changed in the last two years, and that is large language models, okay? Where uh, whether you can have either proprietary things like OpenAI or open source things like uh, Llama or Mistral or whatever your favorite one is, where you can take information in from a variety of sources uh, like publicly available like USPTO um, in principle, if you feel so inclined, you can analyze things that are proprietary like CCAS or Reaxis. But maybe more importantly, um, all this other free text information, we talked about the dig digitized information out there, free text like electronic lab notebooks, like publications, like PhD theses, all of that can go into this. And this is actually something we're actively working on. We developed the tools and the commands in, if you're into machine learning, something called in context learning, where we really can figure out these inferred and implicit data and make it explicit. We can check, check the data. Is the molarity that you give really consistent with what you give it at the yield in the grams or whatever? They can actually figure this out. So you can all these cross-referencing that I'm showing up there. And it turns out if you do the statistics, if you use something like ChatGPT4, it's 100% right based on what we could find. There are things it says, okay, I can't do it, about 3.7% uh, of the cases, but it is pretty reliable to do this. And then you can put this into these kind of open reaction databases. UDM is a standard that is used in Europe and combine it, as I mentioned earlier, with um, feature databases. And with that, I think this is really where I think is the, the future is going, where some of these problems that we're dealing with here can be addressed with modern technology. Thank you very much. Okay, you got a preview in that talk for what's coming up. And um, I, I probably don't have to tell this audience that when you plan a workshop like this, 
um, the protein data bank is the absolute gold standard for the value add that a well curated repository brings. And so we're very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Stephen Burley, who's going to talk to us about um, how that came to be and um, all of the value derived from the protein data bank and um, how that sort of story might inspire other data repositories that are um, that are coming up in the community. And he's an expert in data science and bioinformatics, structural biology, and structure-guided drug discovery for oncology. The director of the RCSB Protein Data Bank, and within Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, he serves as university of as university professor and Henry Rutgers chair, founding director of the Institute of Quantitative Biomedicine and Cancer Pharmacology Research Program co-leader within the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. Professor Burley's previous roles were distinguished Lilly Research Scholar at Eli Lilly and Company, Chief Scientific Officer and Senior Vice President for Research at SGX Pharmaceuticals, Richard M. and Isabel P. Furlow Professor at the Rockefeller University, and Howard Hughes Medical Institute Investigator. His degrees include an MD from Harvard and a Doctor of Philosophy from Oxford, as well as a Bachelor of Science in Physics and an honorary doctorate from Western University. He's published extensively in data science and bioinformatics, AI and machine learning, structural biology, and clinical oncology. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. That's a, a, um, uh, that's a, an introduction that only a mother would believe. So it's, uh, it's an honor for me to be here. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be re representing the RCSB Protein Data Bank here today and my colleagues who are part of the Worldwide Protein Data Bank Partnership. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the value proposition of getting it right 53 years ago. As protein crystallography was being established as a field, the community got together, a minority at the time to be sure, got together and made a, um, a compelling case to the Department of Energy initially that um, the results of protein crystallography experiments should be preserved. There was a lot of opposition in the community initially, people were unwilling to share, but um, here we are 53 years later and everybody has bought in. Uh, so the title of my, my uh, talk is um, Protein Data Bank from Two Pandemics, Two Epidemics to the Global Pandemic to mRNA Vaccines and Paxlovid. So my plan is to tell you about the critical role that structural biologists and the Protein Data Bank, the PDB, together have played in fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. The punchline of my talk was put very succinctly by Dr. Anthony Fauci, who requires no introduction in this audience. In the New York Times Magazine in 2023, he cited the importance of 3D biostructure information and said, show me a person who's vaccinated, got infected, took Paxlovid and died. I can't find anybody. I'll put what Fauci said into context and explain the how the global efforts of the structural biology community and the PDB uh, made all this possible. So as I said, the organization was established as the first open access digital data resource in all of biology and a vanguard in the open access data movement. It was established in 71 with just seven X-ray crystal structures of proteins and it's been continuously funded by the United States government ever since. In biology, function follows form. Uh, this variation on a famous phrase coined by the architect Louis B. Sullivan, succinctly explains that the function of a biological macromolecule is determined by its form, its shape, its 3D structure. Since its inception, the PDB has grown more than 30,000 fold to become the single global resource for experimentally determined atomic level 3D biostructure information. At present, we provide fair fact compliant access to more than 215,000 structures of proteins, nucleic acids, viruses, and macromolecular machines. Recognizing the global importance of the PDB, it's been managed jointly since 2003 by the Worldwide Protein Data Bank Partnership, which includes regional data centers in the US, Europe, Japan, and the People's Republic of China, plus two specialist data repositories for electron microscopy and nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. 
P2B data are essential for responding to emerging viruses. Since the early 2000s, the world has faced down three major outbreaks of coronaviral infections that jumped the species barrier to human. First detected in 02, SARS coronavirus infected about 8,500 individuals worldwide, killing just over 800 people between 2002 and 2004. The second coronavirus epidemic caused by the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS coronavirus struck in 2012. To date, it's killed more than 900 individuals and remains a public health threat in the Middle East and parts of Asia where camels are endemic. Despite these, uh, where, where, they're, where it's endemic in camel populations, despite these two warning signs, very few countries, including the United States, prepared for the possibility of a much more serious coronavirus epidemic. Fortunately for us and the global community, structural biologists and the PDB actually laid the groundwork for a successful response to the inevitable third coronavirus wave. Effective mRNA vaccines were designed and antiviral agents were discovered with the benefit of open access to PDB structures of SARS-CoV, MERS-CoV, and SARS-CoV-2 proteins. The first PDB structure of a SARS-CoV-2 spike protein appropriately using the persistent identifier of 6 Victor Sierra Bravo was released in February 2020, less than a, less than a month after the nucleic acid sequence became available. Today, there are nearly 1,600 SARS-CoV-2 spike protein-related structures in the PDB. Like the earlier coronavirus spike protein structures that are archived in the PDB, they provided important insights into receptor binding, fusion of the viral lipid bilayer with the plasma membrane and vaccine and antibody design. Specifically, the very first mRNA vaccines generated, vaccine designs generated in January 2020 were actually based on PDB structures of the SARS-CoV and the MERS-CoV spike proteins, which are very similar in amino acid sequence and 3D structure to their SARS-CoV-2 counterpart. When designing Moderna's inaugural mRNA-1273 vaccine encoding the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, the company relied on PDB structures of a double proline mutant form of the SARS-CoV and of the MERS-CoV spike protein that stabilized the spike in a highly immunogenic pre-fusion conformation. I believe the vaccine designers at BioNTech, Pfizer used the same information because their inaugural mRNA vaccine encoding the same spike protein included the same mutations. The rest of the story is well known to you. Two essentially identical, highly effective mRNA vaccines against, SARS, against COVID-19 and their successes have been administered now to more than 5.5 billion individuals worldwide with impressive results. Designed with the benefit of open access to PDB structures, they're credited with saving tens of millions of lives worldwide and preventing severe forms of infection in hundreds of millions, if not more than a billion individuals around the world. You've got to love the PDB. The organization of the SARS-CoV-2 genome is depicted schematically in this slide. All coronavirus genomes are very long, single-stranded, positive sense, five prime capped, three prime polyadenylated messenger RNAs that are ready for translation by the host cell ribosome. Most of the non-structural proteins in the virus are expressed within a pair of related polyproteins. The individual non-structural proteins are then excised from the polyprotein by two SARS-CoV-2 proteases that, themselves, that are themselves part of the polyprotein. The papain-like proteinase cuts at three sites here denoted with dark blue down arrows, and the even more important main protease, the focus of the rest of my talk, cuts at 10 sites denoted with light blue inverted triangles. Sorry. So let me turn now to structure-based drug discovery. The PDB currently houses more than 750 crystal structures of the SARS-CoV-2 main protease, or MPRO, the first of which came out of Shanghai ID6 Lima Uniform 7. This protein is the Achilles heel of the virus. Without the main protease, 
the polyprotein cannot be cleaved into, into its constituent non-structural proteins and thereby stopping an infection in its tracks. It's the target of Pfizer's highly effective drug known as Paxlovid, which is a fixed dose combination of nirmatrelvir, the active ingredient, and ritonavir. The nirmatrelvir origin story actually begins back in, two, in the early 2000s with the discovery of PF-00835231, shown here in the right panel inhibiting SARS-CoV main protease in PDBID 6 X-ray hotel mic. This drug was intended by Pfizer for use as an injectable in-hospital antiviral agent for acutely ill patients. It was the product of a structure-based drug discovery campaign at the company that began in 2003 and was facilitated by open access to my structure of the SARS-CoV main protease PDBID 1 Quebec 2 whiskey. This very first structure of the main protease was determined at SGX Pharmaceuticals, where I led R&D as the chief scientific officer. Altruistically, my company deposited the structure to the PDB so that work on countermeasures could begin in, uh, without delay by any, any company that wished to do so. By the mid 2000s, SARS-CoV had disappeared from the scene, the virus had simply vanished, and Pfizer halted the project. In early 2020, Pfizer reactivated the project with the goal of discovering and developing a SARS-CoV-2 antiviral for outpatient use, starting with PDBID 6 Lima Uniform 7, that's the first structure of the SARS-CoV-2 main protease that I talked about earlier. The result at Pfizer was nirmatrelvir, which is shown here in the right panel inhibiting the SARS-CoV-2 main protease. And this is another PDB structure, ID 7 Romeo Foxtrot Whiskey. Both nirmatrelvir and its predecessor, PF-00835231, that I showed on the previous slide, are covalently acting inhibitors of the protease that bind to the active site cysteine residue that's visible within the red circle. When the enzyme encounters the drug, it catalyzes a single turnover reaction that forms that covalent bond and irreversibly inactivates the enzyme. And that prevents the polyprotein from being processed and stops an infection in its tracks. Nirmatrelvir is structurally similar to the first generation Pfizer compound with key chemical differences that allow it to be administered as a pill as opposed to an injectable. Co so but there is one, one major drawback to nirmatrelvir. It's very rapidly metabolized by one of the cytochrome P450s. So it's co-administered with a drug called ritonavir, which is a potent inhibitor of cytochrome P453A4. And that co-administration prolongs the half-life of nirmatrelvir and presents its degradation when the drug passes through the liver. So Paxlovid, a fixed-dose combination of the two drugs, received emergency use authorization from US FDA in 2021 in December, less than two years after public release of the viral genome sequence. So the speed with which Pfizer was able to move was unprecedented. It often takes a decade or more, as many of you know, to go from identifying a drug target to a approval of a new drug. At the end of my talk, I'm going to come back to the fact that Pfizer reported that nirmatrelvir is also active against the main proteases of both SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV. And this important finding will unfortunately lead me to a sobering postscript. So working with the Rutgers Institute for Quantitative Biomedicine colleague, Sagar Kare, we've been collaborating on a study of the diversity of both MPRO active site structures and the polyprotein cut sites of all coronaviruses. There's very high conservation of the amino acids that line the active site across all of the known coronavirus main proteases. Each column in the right panel shows the frequency of each of the 20 possible amino acids at each of the positions of residues that line the active site. Dark blue means that there's no variation in the, in the, uh, in the sequence. Uh, so the dark blue means that the amino acid does not occur at that position. So this tells us when we look at the, the diagram that approximately 12 of the amino acid residues that line the active site of the enzyme don't change throughout the, the evolution of all known coronaviruses. At position number 27, for example, the leucine uh, residue occurs 99% of the time. 
There's similarly high conservation of the main protease polypept polyprotein cut site sequences across all known coronaviruses. Each column in the right panel shows the frequency of each of the 20 possible amino acids occurring at each position P5 through P1 prime in the polyprotein cut sites across all of the known coronaviruses. Again, dark blue identifies amino acids that don't occur in at that position. So you can see at P2, leucine and valine together account for 94% of all amino acid occurrences. At P1, glutamine accounts for 99% of the occurrences. And at P1 prime, it's alanine, asparagine, and serine that together account for 96% of the amino acid occurrences. So what these data are telling us that there is in fact double evolutionary selection pressure at work, both on the 3D structure of the, vir of the viral polyprotein, the viral main protease active site, and the various cut sites for the main protease across the polyproteins. During evolution, the catalytic activity of the of the enzyme has got to be preserved and all of the cut site sequences have got to be preserved. So you've got, you've got conservation of both the enzyme active site structure and conservation of the substrates across all of the known coronaviruses. So going beyond Pfizer's work, we're currently testing in silico predictions that Nirmatrelva is actually going to be a very broad spectrum inhibitor of coronavirus main proteases. So this is what leads me to the sobering postscript. Understanding the evolution of coronavirus main protease active sites in 3D and their polyprotein cut site sequences tells us that the free market for emergency pharmaceuticals actually failed us. So a failure of the free markets is, is defined as an inefficient distribution of goods and services that, that within the economy. These inefficient distributions occur when the incentives for rational economic behavior are good for the individual, but not good for society. So simply put, capitalism is not always the answer to get the, to get the right outcome when it comes to uh, the public good. So for better pandemic preparedness benefiting the entire world, Pfizer could have been incentivized with public money to continue working on structure-based drug discovery of a broad spectrum coronavirus MPRO inhibitor. With the benefit of hindsight, we now know that expenditure of approximately $250 million would have saved millions of lives worldwide while we were waiting for the Moderna and BioNTech vaccines to come online and prevented economic losses in the two, to the tune of trillions of, uh, of dollars. When the mers cov epidemic struck, I argue that there could, should have been a scientifically informed discussion regarding the very real possibility, technically, and the desirability of public investment in pharmacologic countermeasures targeting new coronaviruses crossing the species barrier to humans. Experts knew after MERS that it was simply a matter of when, not if, there would be another jump to human with the possibility of a global pandemic. We were very lucky the first two times. We were extremely unlucky the third time. Fortunately, though, for us, Pfizer made a very substantial investment back in the early 2000s during the SARS-CoV epidemic, which set the, the stage for very rapid discovery development and emergency use authorization of Paxlovid. Similarly, the, the NIH made a huge investment in the development of mRNA vaccine technology. So the recent successes that we've seen with SARS-CoV-2 have revolutionized how vaccines are designed, manufactured, tested in the clinic, and undergo regulatory approval. So to recap, I've explained how open access to research, research data generated with both public and private funds, particularly 3D structures of coronavirus proteins archived in the PDB, enabled basic and applied researchers to make a difference during the pandemic that the world desperately needed them to, uh, to make, to succeed. So to quote Dr. Fauci once again, show me a person who's vaccinated, got infected, took Paxlovid and died. I can't find anybody. You've got to love the PDB. So thank you. I'm very grateful to the NSF, NIH, and DOE, which collectively fund the PDB, the RCSB PDB, our hosts at Rutgers, UCSD, and UCSF, 
and all of our partners in the Worldwide Protein Data Bank. And then shown on this slide is the very large team of structural biologists, data scientists, software developers, and IT professionals who together, working with me, deliver the RCSP PDB data and services to many millions of users uh, around the world at no charge and with no limitations on data usage. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. Really inspiring talk. Um, we're going to shift gears now from the interface of chemistry and biology to the interface of chemistry and material science. And we're going to hear about a younger repository that's nonetheless off to a smashing start. Um, Ale Strachan is the Riley Professor of Materials Engineering at Purdue University and the co-director of NSF's Nano Hub. That's lowercase N-A-N-O, capital H-U-B. Before joining Purdue, he was a staff member in the, in the theoretical division of Los Alamos National Laboratory and worked as a postdoc and scientist at Caltech. He received a PhD in physics from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. And his research focuses on development of predictive atomistic and multi-scale models to describe materials from first principles and their combination with data science to address problems of technological or scientific importance. Areas of interest include high energy density and active materials, metallic alloys for high temperature applications, materials and devices for nanoelectronics and energy, as well as polymers and their composites. In addition, his scholarly work includes cyber infrastructure to make simulations, models, and data widely accessible and useful for research and education. And he's been recognized by several awards, including the Early Career Faculty Fellow Award from TMS in 2009, an R&D 100 award in the category of Software and Services for NanoHub, and the Riley Chair Professorship in 2023. Please join me in welcoming Ale. Thank you. So I'd like to tell you uh, about this infrastructure nano hub for open simulation and uh, data. So what we're what we seek to do is connect research grade software and data infrastructure with uh, their end users who are domain experts, but not computational experts. They could be uh, students, instructors, experimentalists. And so the way we do that is we allow software developers to publish their codes in ways that they're that are accessible. We turn research codes into apps that you can run on your web browser as fully self-contained end-to-end workflows for data uh, that are presented to our end users. Uh, all of these products are actual publications. Uh, they have DOIs, they're indexed by Web of Science. And as I will discuss, they are fair. And what we do, the, our team on NanoHub is develop the infrastructure that makes this possible. And um, as you can guess, with all of these uh, simulation infrastructure and tools, we have quite a bit of educational content. So let me show you an example of what I mean by making tools available. So if you want to run a molecular dynamic simulation, there's open source codes. Uh, we use one that's called LAMPS from Sandia National Labs. You have to get uh, access to uh, computational resources. You have to install LAMPS, and then you have to learn to speak LAMPS, okay? And this is a relatively simple LAMPS script. This is an ad hoc language, uh, which has nothing to do with knowing about molecular dynamics. It's just how LAMPS wants you to talk to it. And we take months training students to do that. So on NanoHub, we can wrap this tool around an app that's delivered on your website. And with a few clicks, we have undergrad students running molecular dynamics and learning about material science uh, without worrying about the computational intricacies of running the simulation and providing hardware. So this is one example out of many that I'll uh, discuss. Uh, we also have end-to-end -end data science uh, workflows where all you need is an internet connection and a standard web browser. Everything is containerized. Every, everything will run the same uh, to everyone. And NanoHub is truly a community platform. We have about 800 published apps and tools. Um, 
170 courses, thousands of educational resources. Um, and these are contributed by eight, uh, 1,800 or so folks from all over the world. Um, we have performed, uh, so uh, 250,000 individuals have run simulations on NanoHub from all over the world. Um, we run about a million simulations every year for our users. Um, we have 1.5 million visitors every year to the site and NanoHub has gathered about 2,500 citations in the open literature. Um, so how can a, a simulation infrastructure help with fair data and address the, the challenges that we're discussing in this meeting? Um, I know this is preaching to the choir. We've discussed this uh, before. We all know we have a data problem, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Um, but we generate data in our field in material science and chemistry at a quite a high cost. And the majority of the data ends up languishing on local resources, computational resources. Um, we talked about this. We, the data we share ends up being um, biased. Uh, we have a, I have a colleague from the aerospace industry that told me, look, Ale, you publish on this side of the distribution, we design planes on the opposite side of the distribution of properties. And uh, we just don't share except for selected results. When I was walking in the building today, I saw this quote from Einstein uh, that I think it's appropriate, right? We have the responsibility uh, to not conceal part of the information as scientists. And uh, uh, biased publishing uh, can get very close to concealing uh, in some cases. And then we talked about this also, when we publish these results, the results are not what I would call machine learning ready, meaning they're not accessible by machines. The metadata is not there, it's very hard. We don't have traceability really, there, it's not actionable. And so, I, one thing that I think it's important to understand is that this is this doesn't apply just to publications or data. Um, it applies, and I think it applies particularly importantly um, to data uh, workflows. It's not just the data, but the workflows that generate the data. Whether you run experiments and you have raw data and you analyze them in certain manners and you produce your outcomes, or you have a, a, a simulation workflow that invariant, invariably re, uh, involves multiple steps, pre-processing pre -processing steps, running your actual simulation, maybe in a high performance computing and post-processing those results before you publish. All that needs to be made fair and reproducible. Um, and so what we do in NanoHub is we ask the tool developers, the workflow, work for, workflow developers, to write this in Jupyter and uh, formally declare inputs and outputs in that uh, Jupyter workflow. And when you do that, we do uh, automatic unit conversion. We were talking about this earlier. The, the simulation software or libraries check for consistencies of those inputs. And then, what we do is we take this workflow and we publish it on NanoHub. So we're a publisher of FAIR workflows. Uh, these workflows, each one of these simulation tools, the 800 of them have DOIs. Um, the inputs and outputs of the workflows are queryable uh, through an API. So you can ask, hey, do you have a workflow that would do this? Or what type of uh, inputs do you need to run workflow X? Um, more important or equally importantly, um, these workflows are containerized. And so they're not just fair, but they're reproducible. These workflows would run on NanoHub the exact same way today, a year from today, for as long as we can run these containers. We have tools on NanoHub that are 20 years old and they still run the same way they used to run. Um, and so, in my opinion, putting making code available on Git um, doesn't guarantee that the person who downloads the code will get the same result that you obtained when you run your code originally on your hardware with your libraries. All of this is uh, containerized on NanoHub, so it works 
um, for everyone the same way. And then these workflows, I like to think of them as the quantum of compute uh, can be accessed and launched in multiple ways. They can be accessed via apps for undergrad students where you click a couple of buttons, press simulate and you run the, the workflow. Or like in this example, they are launched from a machine learning workflow that seeks to optimize a property, an optimization algorithm. Um, the, the workflow that I was discussing a minute ago uses molecular dynamics, these code lamps, to calculate the melting temperature of an alloy. That was developed by PhD level students, multiple steps, is the simulation converged? Uh, can I make a decision about the melting temperature or is it a negative result? All that is done at the PhD level. Uh, an undergrad student in my lab had wanted to learn about machine learning so he consumed these simulations as a service and he worked on the machine learning loop that called for these simulations and got the results. And he ended up writing a paper uh, consuming this quantum of compute that we call symptoms. Um, importantly, every time you run anyone around the world, runs one of these symptoms, we store the inputs and the outputs because you had to formally declare the inputs and the outputs so we know what they are. They're indexed on a database that's globally accessible. We call it the results database. Um, so when, by the time we published the paper, the data was already fair, okay? You can explore the data. Um, you can see here melting temperatures as a function of composition. If you look at the top right, you see every single simulation we performed including all the simulations that did not converge. So you can learn what type of input parameters lead to convergence and which input parameters lead to a result from which you cannot make a decision. So negative results are automatically stored. This really accelerates innovation. Uh, and I think there's a strong driving force to, to sharing these type of workflows. Uh, I'm, I understand I'm a little short on time, but these type of tools can be used for experimentalists too. We have tools that ingest raw experimental data. We spend with undergrad students four months collecting oxidation data from the literature. And then the simulation tool gets this raw data from experiments, automatically analyzes the data against 42 possible models for oxidation. It does a statistically rigorous calibration and model selection. So it tells you what is the mechanism, what are the models to describe your data and ranks all these models. And then we compare that with what the original author had said. Guess what? How many of you think that the authors, when you collect experimental data, they fit 42 models and do model selection? None of them. Okay, so about 30% of the data, published data, the model selected was not in the top five of our analysis, okay? So we have inconsistent data in experiments and that's a problem when, we, when you want to do machine learning. Um, we use this for education quite a bit. I'm not going to discuss the details, but in undergrad classes, core classes at, at Purdue, we use these data infrastructures to teach fundamental material science. And so I, I think this is particularly important um, because of two things. First of all, workforce development, the future engineers need to be familiar with what we're discussing here in this meeting. They need to be users. They need to be uh, used to making the data born ML ready and AI ready. But at the same time, we were talking about um, our responsibility with society and having educating citizens who can actually consume data and can make their own decisions about the data that's available. Well, they need to have access to these modern tools and know how to use it. And I think we have to do that at the undergraduate level. And so this is, this is uh, being done today. Uh, last thing I, I want to discuss, um, making data findable in the way us geeks talk about metadata and uh, doing a query and writing a Python uh, 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 query is one thing. I think we have to be smarter. 
okay? We uh, publish as, as uh, globally the same number of papers as there are new songs coming out every year, okay? I bet I can ask any middle schooler in the country to find a song and they will find it better and faster than my PhD students can find the paper, okay? And so we are actually using LLMs uh, to train private models that uh, we're, going to, we're using as uh, uh, a chatbot within private data from NanoHub. So the model can recommend what you should do, how to consume the data, what state is available, and personalized recommendations uh, based on what you've done. Okay, you're a material scientist, you've seen this tool and that tool. Here are other things you can do next. Um, and um, so, so I, I think we need to, when we talk about uh, making things findable, making things access accessible, we have to think a little bit outside the box and learn from other fields uh, in society. Finally, I want to tell you a little bit about the impact. Um, I, well, not 250, this is 250,000 simulations user, uh, uh, users served. Uh, NanoHub is used in 77% of all minority serving institutions in the US. And uh, we've, we've done outreach efforts, we lower the barriers, we make things easy to and usable, truly usable. And the, what you see on the right are uh, institutions ranked in terms of the number of simulation users on NanoHub, okay? Number one is Purdue, that's not surprising, we're headquartered at Purdue. And then you see Arizona State, UIC, Northwestern, MIT, Harvard, Stanford, top universities, R1 institutions. Uh, but within this list, uh, we have Florida Agriculture Mechanical University. Ball State is an R2 university in Muncie, Indiana. Um, we have University of Texas at El Paso. Chicago State University is a um, HBCU. And we're very proud of this list. Okay, with the top engineering schools in the country, uh, we, we have the ability to reach really a, a broad population. Um, and I'll stop uh, with this. We have a, a grassroots organization in the materials community called MARDA. And coincidentally, uh, today is yesterday and today and tomorrow, this is our annual meeting. So this is the Materials Research Data Alliance. and uh, in we're pushing for the same uh, type of goals, and I would encourage you to visit our uh, website and check out our meeting. Uh, we have one of the um, Fair O's um, NSF awards. Ours is called Martian, and it's to bring fair data to uh, the materials science community. And this is a short paper that we put together to push our community uh, towards fair data with baby steps individuals can do and also collective actions. And it'd be, be good to share notes and, and collaborate here. I have some thoughts here, but maybe we can leave that for the panel. Thank you very much. I'm gonna kick things off with a question I didn't anticipate asking, but you know, I just wanna show everybody that I was a good moderator because I listened to all the talks. And after I heard them all, it, it brought to mind a, a, a somewhat different question than what I had originally intended. So. Here's my my question to all four of you, which is that it, it's very clear to me from listening to all these talks that that all of you are very much, frankly, data scientists. And when I was in graduate school, data science wasn't really a big part of the curriculum. And so what I'm wondering is if each of you could talk a little bit about your journey to becoming a data scientist in the context of um, what else you had done and then what you think we can do to um, improve data science education and more generally motivate departments and students to get more serious about teaching people in various different scientific disciplines to be data scientists in addition. The, yeah, there's a picture. Um, so I, I I can start. I'm I, I'm not a data scientist, I, but I can play one on TV. Uh, the I 
it seems to me that in, in engineering or in chemistry, I don't think we necessarily want to turn our students into data scientists. Um, it, because if, if we do, first of all, uh, our companies and national labs will not going to be able to hire them because they won't be able to pay the salaries that the companies uh, off, will offer them. Uh, so I think we need to teach them and educate them into being uh, expert users of modern tools. Uh, I see these as uh, what, you know, Excel or a word processor used to be 30 years ago. Um, you have to understand how it works. You, you can drive a car and be a competent driver without knowing how an internal, internal combustion engine works. And then when you switch to a, uh, an electric vehicle, you don't have to relearn how to do it. So to me, that's what we need to do is teach them the fundamentals so they uh, understand the limits of what they're doing and uh, teach them how to use them, be competent users of that technology. Um, I would think I would disagree with Jake. You were a data scientist because, well, I mean, what is a science, what is a data scientist, right? A data scientist is a scientist who works with data. Um, and so you didn't call yourself that, but you clearly were doing that. Now, I do think there is a, uh, an educational effort that uh, is needed here and, and CCAS and, and some of the other things we're involved with actually doing this, um, but very similar to what Ali was saying, it's, it, you know, it's not, you're not a data scientist. You pick these things up along the way, just as you would, you know, a new NMR software or something, because um, it's not that hard. Um, and given, given the context of say your standard computational chemistry course or something, um, you can easily derive modules that would give you or give the students the kind of knowledge that Ali was talking about. So I guess uh, I'm more of a data evangelist than <laughs> has, has become clear today. Um, how did I get there though? I started as a radio astronomer and we used to publish our data as contour plots. And I remember as a graduate student, do I draw this contour at two sigma or 2.1 sigma or 1.9 sigma? Because where I drew that contour would show or not show something that I believed was in the data. And I thought, you know, this isn't very honest. I should, I should share the data and let people draw their own contours or whatever and decide if my interpretation is believable to them. So it was, it, it was that thing about transparency that drove me from doing my own research to working at the boundary between research and technology that enables better research to be done through better data management. And um, that said, I think the skills associated with data science, understanding statistics, understanding uncertainty characterization um, are incredibly important. And if we're not teaching those skills along with the skills in the basic science, then we're not doing our duty as educators. So I'd like to start by thanking Jake for um, calling me a data scientist because I have been struggling for 10 years to reinvent myself as a data scientist. So I. I have on my third career, one was just traditional academic structural biology research. The second was uh, R and D in the in the pharmaceutical industry. And now I'm now I'm uh, now I'm thanks to you, a data scientist uh, running the uh, the RCSB Protein Data Bank. We are tackling just these issues at uh, Rutgers right now with the <clears throat> genesis of a, uh, a big data science initiative. And the question that keeps coming up is what should we be teaching the biology grad students to make sure that they're actually gonna be competitive in the future knowing that biology is increasingly a data game. So um, things like Python programming, I think probably very important to expose the, the, the molecular biology, cell biology grad students to because they've probably never done it before. They weren't the kind of the nerdy kids that, that taught themselves Python in high school. They were, probably a quantitative, a numerate or enumerate, uh, 
when they uh, when they got started. And then the other thing that uh, is, that uh, is going to be part of the mandatory curriculum, just as you said, is statistics. They've got to understand its uncertainties in terms of data, error bars, etc. And we, you know, we don't expect these individuals to be developing new AI methods, new machine learning tools, but we know that they're going to be using these and they, they need to be using them with you know, eyes open. And we need to prepare them for, uh, you know, for that, that brave new world where, you know, where many of them won't do experiments. Many of them will be looking at data sets, whether it's in the protein data bank or some genome sequence data bank. Um, I think it's incredibly exciting for the future of biology, but but daunting in terms of what we need to do to prepare the students, recognizing that most of them have come to biology having fled calculus, et cetera. I mean, it, it's almost it's almost a given that the, the, the guys, who, the individuals, the women and the men who choose to, to do PhDs in, in molecular and cell biology didn't do well in math in the early parts of college. They probably didn't do well in organic chemistry either, which means, which explains why they didn't go to med school. These are the people we've got to get to because, you know, like it or not, they're the ones who are going to do the research. All right, um, let's jump to an online question. I, I think this may be a quick one. Um, this is for Bob. It says, OSTP pegged the cost of federal open access publishing in 2023 at less than 400 million a year in their November 2023 report to Congress, which was at least partially authored by Dr. Zaring Halam. Can you square that with your estimate? The federal government is covering 10 times that amount. No. <laughs> I, I just sort of did a seat of the pants estimate as we do in astronomy, and I don't vouch for the 10% number with any serious analysis. I just a, looked at, you know, how much money goes into major publishers and did a simple division. I think, I don't know, that $400 million number does seem a bit low to me, and I don't know what the, um, you know, what, what the math was done there, but it's a lot it's a lot of money that goes into publishing and you wouldn't see um, certain publishers with 30 and 40 percent profit margins if there were not a lot of money flowing into that system I think the more important part of the point was that for you know a comparable or lower quantity we could sustain the repositories and I I, I want to jump to that next um I, when I talked to Stephen beforehand, um, he mentioned to me that um, his talk would focus on the community benefits and that during the panel, he would um, hold forth on uh, how the PDB has managed to sustain itself. And so I'm going to invite you to do that. And then we'll um, go down the road to talk a little bit about um, how um, other people are sustaining repositories that they discussed. So the it, it, what I said at the outset that the PDB was the first open access digital data resource in all of biology is not an exaggeration. It's also not an exaggeration to say that we've been living at least the, the spirit of the fair and fact principles, not necessarily the letter, but the spirit of the fair and fact principles for the last 50 plus years. The, the question of um, sustainability is... Um, is I think continues to be a challenging one, even for an institution like the RCSB Protein Data Bank, which is an organization which is funded to the tune of 10 million a year. That's my current funding from NIH, NSF, and DOE combined. 50% from NSF, 40% from NIH, and 10% from, uh, from DOE. What transpired this cycle for the funding renewal, and we're just in the final stages of that, was a huge surprise to me. In 2018, when I went through the, the, the previous renewal, I was put through the ringer to prove value. I was told in no uncertain terms, we do not want to see letters from Nobel Prize winners telling us that the PDB is important. We want you to show us the data. So we published a series of peer reviewed papers that documented the economic impact, the impact on the literature, the impact on the patent literature uh, of PDB data based on hard numbers. And that got me a modest increase in the, um, in the funding. It got me about a, got, got me from six to 7 million a year. What got me from 7 million a year to 10 million a year was the pandemic. 
they finally got it because they saw the real world example of uh, of how structural biologists and how the PDB played a critical role in the pandemic. I, I think I think ultimately it's about I think all I've said this in his presentation it's ultimately about the value that you can document that the that the resource is is providing. Could I use more money? Of course I could. I, I wish I'd lobbied because my mother got eleven million a year instead of ten million a year, but it. Uh, but I, I am deeply grateful and humbled by the responsibility that uh, that I've had for the last 10 years. I should say for those online, as well as in the room, that I we are in the process at Rutgers of identifying and recruiting a successor to run the Protein Data Bank uh, here at the, the US Worldwide Protein Data Bank Data Center, the RCSB PDB. There's an ad in Science Magazine <laughs> <laughs> uh, trying to recruit my successor. If anybody is interested in the job who feels they're qualified, um, please apply. I need to get this monkey off my back. I want to go back to doing full-time research. And um, I look forward to ushering in a successor who is going to take the PDB to even higher heights. Our focus is on somebody who combines strengths in both structural biology and data science, because I'm convinced that the future of the PDB rests very substantially on, on, the, use of, on the use of data and ensuring that the data that are stored in the PDB are interoperable with all sorts of different types of bio data, because we've got a huge ecosystem that we have to interoperate within. So I'll stop there. Let me just, it looks like there's a quick follow-up, which is when companies make products or money using information from the PDB, do they pay royalties to the PDB and to the researchers who generated the data that they use? Um, the question of whether or not they pay royalties to the people who generated the data depends on what patent protection or what intellectual property protection the university might have sought on the on the uh, on behalf of those investigators. All of the data in the PDB are distributed under the most permissive Creative Commons license CC zero, and that means anybody in the world can download the data at no charge with no limitations on usage. And it's my understanding based on a very detailed analysis of drug approvals by US FDA that every one of the recent anti-cancer drug approvals in the last 10 years or so has used PDB data at some point to, to facilitate the, um, the discovery and development of the new anti-cancer agent. And if you look across all therapeutic areas, again, over the last decade or so, the approval of the US FDA drugs for these all these different, uh, different types of diseases, it was about 90% facilitated by PDB data. Ali, tell us about uh, the sustainability model for NanoHub. Yeah, so uh, NanoHub has been supported for two decades by the National Science Foundation. It uh, has been about a $65 million investment by NSF. If you think about the number of simulation users, it's about $250 per user, simulation user that NSF has paid. Um, yet, uh, this is the, we're in our last year of NSF support. So sustainability is a challenge, right? We've, we're working with NSF to try to see if they can continue supporting NanoHub in another uh, form. We have partners, so NanoHub is not going anywhere. We, we have lots of partners, uh, but it, it is uh, our funding model in this country is not conducive to, to supporting infrastructure that benefits uh, our community, be it research or education, okay? And so we have partners now, workforce development partners. As I said, we're working with NSF, but I think something that they, we need to change the landscape and something that can be done by the funding agencies is, and by our colleagues, to be quite frank, is to resist the idea of reinventing the wheel every time you one grant writes a grant and uh, and decide well i'm going to reuse what already exists and i'm going to build my research based on that nsf supported lots of nano effort uh, materials uh, discovery type mgi type work 
um, they never suggested to the authors that they make their data, make their tools available on NanoHub, which is their own product, right? And so these data mandates uh, could have more teeth. And I think we all need to, funding agencies and academic institutions need to resist the idea of everyone thinks, well, NanoHub is a website. We invested a hundred million dollars, including Purdue support on that website, okay? It's not a website. And people think, well, I can create a hub on my own with my grad student. Guess, guess what? That's not sustainable. That's not going to work. And we need that will help sustain efforts that are actually useful by the, the value they provide. Absolutely. Olaf? It's kind of, well, I think the first thing that I hear from, from listening to the two of you, I really need to ask for a raise. But um, <laughs> um, no, I think the, the difference here is we're in a diff very different part of, of the, the life cycle of the uh, data infrastructure. Um, I mean, PDB obviously has been around for 50 years. Um, your system has been 20. Um, you've been about a year and a half now. So it's a different, very different um, uh, part of the life cycle. Having said that, uh, as I mentioned already in the presentation, I think the key to it is demonstrating value and documenting value. Um, and I think if we can do that, uh, then I will be quite optimistic uh, of have, getting this funded in a sustainable way. We still will have to ask every, you know, four or five years for renewal. And I'm fine with that because every now and then, then you need to justify what you're doing. But as long as we can do this, I'm pretty optimistic about this resource being, being sustainable. And if not, then probably you should go away. If, you know, in that case, you make sure that what is there stays there and you move on. All right. Um, I just, are there folks in the room who have questions? Yeah, uh, please. Uh, Luis Sanchez, associate professor at Niagara University. Uh, I have a question about the uh, open reaction uh, database. Uh, I've been using SciFinder for about 20 years uh, or so, right? And I was thinking about the FAIR uh, data practices, and I would say that in my field, uh, the findability can be a little tricky, right? You need to use something like SciFinder to get uh, information about organic reactions and all that. And um, my today, I just learned that the, uh, the open uh, reaction database also gets data from SciFinder. And then uh, my, like, I just thought about it, like how, um, we're talking about SciFinder maintaining this uh, database for, for for a long time, and I wonder how what if 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 this is fair to SciFinder or the ACS that suddenly they are gonna uh, lose subscribers because they can find the same information uh, for free. Uh, we should ask Sarah that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I'm sure this maybe has this question has appeared before, right? Do you, want, do you want to weigh in on that before we go to the panel? Can we give her a mic? Maybe to preempt some misunderstanding, we do not currently read in data from these. All I'm saying, it is possible. The idea is that the infrastructure is there to um, take data from many different sources, some of which are uh, proprietary and and protected like SciFinder or Reaxis or things like that. Um, other things that are open like USPTO, which we actually do use. Um, but then I think the real challenge, but also the mother load in terms of data is actually the thesis, the uh, electronic lab notebooks, if, and that's a big if, we can clean those up. Um, so there's a lot of lost information that is out there that we then can do, uh, put in. And then, you know, there's some things about linking directly to ELNs and so on. But no, um, uh, we do not uh, read in data from, from proprietary sources. 
Yeah, but let's just, if you want to just comment on the nexus of the, you know, fair repositories and SciFinder and how you see those fitting in together. Yeah, isn't that an interesting question? Um, you know, uh, so I'm, I'm I'm not here speaking on behalf of my colleagues at SciFinder. Um, they kind of run a, a separate business from from ours. Um, they they spend a lot of efforts and resources to uh, license in data uh, to to be able to to use uh, for their products. Um, I think. Uh, as they consider like what their their future opportunities look like, you know, they 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 see lots of opportunities in data around life sciences. They see lots of opportunities around data in material science. So I think for SciFinder, it's thinking more broadly about data across sciences and and you know perhaps think about how to, how what kinds of uh, cross disciplinary things can can you figure out when you can collect all of the data as long as it is fair, right? All right, let's go over to that side. I'm going to ask a somewhat self-serving question here, um, and that regards uh, data and metadata standards. Um, and so given that uh, data and metadata standards sort of enable um, interoperability and reuse, whose job is it to catalyze and sustain those standards? Um, for example, is it the community? Is it uh, the device manufacturers? Is it um, the repositories themselves? And uh, in addition to that, are there good frameworks or exemplars of when this process has been done well? You, you weren't listening. It's Bob's job. Ah, okay. <laughs> Universally. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all, all on me. Um, yeah, there are. There, I'll start with there are good examples. Uh, again, going back to my days in astronomy. Um, in astronomy, we developed an uh, international data standard called FITS, which has a core metadata model, which is very simple. And because it was simple, it was adopted um, globally and is the standard that NASA, uh, all major astronomical facilities use for uh, for data storage and transport. Um, that led to the Virtual Observatory, which is a suite of standards, metadata standards for data discovery and data access. But I think what it takes uh, in other communities is a collective will. Uh, coming to NIST, as I did 10 years ago, I saw a lack of metadata standards and material science for discovery. And so we constituted a working group under the auspices of the Research Data Alliance to develop uh, a vocabulary and, and metadata dictionary for describing data holdings in material science. And the way we did it uh, in, in both cases is you get knowledgeable people in a room, you put a bottle of scotch and lock the door and don't let them come out until they've, <laughs> they've agreed. Um, no, it, 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 takes, uh, it takes time. Uh, it takes sometimes a couple of years uh, at least to develop a community standard, but you have to do it with the community so that you have community buy-in, you have community participation and ownership. You can't, as a, you can't unilaterally declare, here's the standard you're gonna use because people will say, well, what? I, I had nothing to do with that. You, you can't force that on me. So it's, it's, again, it's a social engineering challenge, but it's one that can be successful when you demonstrate the value and the interoperability that you get as a result. Stephen, go ahead. So the story at the Protein Data Bank, very similar, community engagement, initially in the small molecule crystallographic community led to the creation of the CIF, the crystallographic information format. That was then adapted by the Protein Data Bank in consultation with the structural biology community to create PDBX, MMCIF, macromolecular CIF. Subsequently, we worked with the protein structure prediction community, again, a different working group, to create model CIF that underpins the alpha fold predictions of protein structure and the predictions of protein structure that are stored in the model archive. We just published what we just got accepted, hasn't actually appeared in print yet a paper describing the creation of the integrative hybrid method SIF, which is a sort of a superset for structural biology involving multiple tools being brought to bear to determine structures of very large, very complex systems that won't succumb to a single, a single measurement technique. So the key has been consistently has been one of community engagement, community buy-in, 
<clears throat> I should say the same thing that took place with respect to the standards of validating both the experimental information that's stored in the PDB or in the electron microscopy data bank or in the biological magnetic resonance data bank and the validation of the atomic coordinates that are stored in the protein data bank against both known chemistry and against the experimental data. None of this could have been done without the buy-in of the community. And in fact, the utilization of some of the community software tools that underpin the, uh, the validation calculations. I, I would add briefly that I, I don't think you want to let the good be the, ex, the, the enemy of the excellent. And sometimes not even within a community, but you need a sub-community to agree on these metadata, especially in a field like materials where we call it the materials genome initiative, but we don't have a genome in materials. Every lab measures things differently. And so it's it's hard except for sub communities to agree on a general set of metadata that you would use to describe a materials. And you have soft materials and ceramics and metals and microstructure. Everyone measures microstructure differently. And the example that I was showing is a relatively simple example where from very simple data, different labs measure completely different things. So as long as we share the raw data and the analysis tools and the decisions, the, the workflow that we use to make decisions, then someone else can come and decide that this is not the right appropriate way of analyzing the data and you can evolve your metadata with it. And this is this is actually a, a very important point. Um, when you do this, uh, I think a, a decent amount of humility is is probably called for because what is was your data now, the next great tool comes along, which you haven't thought of when when you designed these standards. If you have the data, the original data available, and you can reanalyze it. This is what I meant earlier in the talk when I said, data over format. Um, go to the original data because you have no idea what's going to happen with it five years from now, nor does the rest of the community. And so having the respect towards the data and, and what might be hidden in there that you currently don't see uh, should inform these kind of standards. Add that we, we had to add a whole raft of new metadata items to PDBX MMSIF data standard to accommodate the data coming from the free electron laser crystallography experiments, which are fundamentally different in the way they're done from the traditional synchrotron crystallography experiments. But we have this working group, we brought in the right experts to help us, and we now have a set of data standards that fully support the archiving of an of the, the extended metadata coming from the free electron laser at Stanford and the same one at, in Hamburg, the Russian European joint initiative, et cetera. Thanks, that was a really good question. Um, let me build on it a little bit, um, specifically going back to, to Ale and Olaf. Um, how do you publicize to the community at large that your repository is um you know basically open to them and providing them with with a value add you know we have this problem at the journal because you know people will just send us you know scans in the pdf that are not fair and we'll say you know can you do something more okay yes we'll just dump it all in zenodo right which is not really tangibly different from putting it in the pdf and so the the question is you know there's a there's a small but surmountable barrier to get people to, you know, adopt better metadata standards and and help facilitate reuse of their data, but but it's a barrier. And and you know what 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 can you do um as sort of repository directors to help people be aware of, you know, how much value they can derive by surmounting that barrier. Um, I think we were, even though we are fairly early on in the game, I think we were very lucky in that um, we have a major bullhorn in both some of the leaders in these communities uh, that, that use machine learning method for synthesis and say, look, this is 
this is what we're using and here's the demonstrating value. But then on the other side, uh, where in industry, where quite a few of these, these methods are more applied. And yes, they do tend to be a bit more top down. In other words, some of their industry leaders simply decide this is how we're gonna do things. And that's the end of that. Um, so having that level of a bullhorn has been, been very, very useful. Of course, you know, the, 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 the write-ups and things like chemical engineering news and such also help. Yeah, we, it's similar to us, for us. We've, we've organized, we organize workshops. We organize teach the teacher events where we bring, uh, uh, instructors and we tell them, Hey, we can, here's a lecture that you can give and here's the homework assignment. And this is how you introduce this to your students. We do a lot of that and would really be very interesting in partnering with uh, publishers. So NanoHub is one of the options that is uh, offered to their uh, uh, authors uh, uh, for depositing their material. So there are carrots and there are sticks. In the case of the protein data bank, it's the, the key to the success was the stick provided by the protein crystallography community. 20 years ago, 20 plus years, <laughs> years ago, thought leaders in the protein crystallography community came together and made a judgment that every publication should be accompanied by a PDB ID. No questions asked, mandatory. They went to the journals. Science was one of the early adopters. Thank you. They also went to the funders and said, we advise you to stop funding people who will not put their data into the PDB. And that actually happened in some cases. So, so in a sense, we have a captive audience with our depositors, the structural biologists, but it's a captive audience we try to treat extremely well and cater to their needs because we want them to be happy. We want them to deposit complete high quality data that will then be promulgated to the rest of the community for their, for their free use. But it did ultimately take the community coming together and saying, no more, we must all share our data. Various holdouts, including Nobel laureates, were forced to come in line, but uh, but it did happen. All right, thanks, Bob. Any anything to add? All right, Marty. Great. Okay, so incredibly inspiring session. Looking at how well thoughtfully designed data sets democratized can lead to real advances. <clears throat> of course, we can look backwards at historical data and now have seen great examples of where that can be very empowering. But to be provocative, in some sense, looking forward, some of the most powerful discoveries we're seeing can be generated through actually iterative on-demand generation of new small data sets through active learning loops, let's say under Bayesian optimizer-based algorithm. If we can democratize the data graveyard, if you will, to be provocative, how do we democratize the closed loop kind of forward generated automated discovery because the power in the latter approach may far outweigh anything we've ever seen in the looking backwards approach. I can chime in quickly. If if the, um, the, the acquisition function that you're using is computational, I, I think we have lots of uh, ways of democratizing it. We I showed an example of using active learning on NanoHub uh, one of the participants of a workshop from India uh, was there, learned about active learning, and he wrote a paper using NanoHub resources um, and entirely on his own following what, what we had done. The, the key challenge, in my opinion, moving forward is connecting these uh, data infrastructures and AI systems to labs. Uh, whether it's complete, completely uh, autonomously or their manual steps, uh, we can move in that direction. And there's lots of efforts of even low cost labs, uh, little small printers that you can buy and put even in a high school lab where you can, that can be driven by an AI system. And so I think that's a way of encouraging a uh, large number of, uh, 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 citizen scientists. Um, 
to some degree, this is already happening. So uh, uh, co-scientist, which is um, a system built at Carnegie Mellon um, as part of CCAS, uh, does some of that. Uh, I think the question here becomes where, when, when you have these smaller data sets that you mean, um, and then where, where you do learning on, how do you identify them? So this, this idea about intentional, what is the right data? And so for that is, I think we're still learning on how to identify these, these data spaces uh, that you then explore. Once you've done this, I think you can move in fairly quickly. And I think all the machinery to do this already exists. But this initial part, I think that's a bit of an unsolved problem, in my opinion. If, if you can define the question, then you can start thinking about, OK, I need this kind of data to do this, and it would take me this long to do that. Um, but that initial step, I think, is, is where people are currently working on. We have a, a question from Zoom that I confess I don't know the answer to, which is, what is the end game if a repository runs out of money and has to shut down? Have there been high profile examples? Has someone swooped in to archive the data? And how do we think about that in a cost benefit sense as they start proliferating and that risk increases? So there, there was a company in our field in, in material science called Citrin Informatics. The company is still there and they supported an open a repository for the academic com community where they provided the services for free. And uh, they, were they are still very much involved with the community. We had data sets there on their repository and the company all of a sudden decided, well, this is not in our interest anymore. And so they shut down. And so of course the data was available, right? People could download entire data, but we had to find other homes uh, for the data that we had deployed there. So this is um, always a concern. And I think as a community, we need to, this is a very important question because there are examples and this will continue to happen. And we need to think about sustainability. These are active resources, right? So you need to maintain them and you need to keep the lights on uh, if, if people want to access them. I think the higher, highest risk here is not for, you know, reasonably well-established repositories, but for the, the long tail data. Somebody has a three-year grant, they produce a nice data set, the grant expires, uh, the funding at the university, well, that's not our problem. And there are probably uncountable data sets like that have been, that have been lost completely. Um, you know, in, in uh, other areas, you know, some in some NSF funded repositories have tried to go private, gone, gone to subscription models and, and pay to deposit models. I, I wrote a co-wrote a paper of 10 years ago on sustaining domain repositories. And, and you know, that's a, a model. But a lot of people don't want to pay for stuff, <laughs> <laughs> especially when it's been free before. Absolutely. And that's why I argue so forcefully for the for what I think is the right approach, which is the funders have to accept the responsibility for long term support of the research outputs that they create through their funding. And it's not that expensive and they just should do it. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm aware of a, um, a $300 million data dump data abandonment that was by the um, national by the um, uh, National Institute of General Medical Sciences. They spent 300 million over 15 years supporting the protein structure initiative. And at the end of it, they killed it. And when asked, well, what should we do with the data? They said, throw it away. We're not going to pay you to, sust to sustain it. And all of those data were lost. And there was a lot just going back to comments that were made earlier, there were a lot of negative results there that were actually very, very valuable. And that was all, all those data were abandoned. Should have tapped HHMI. Was that, was that a possibility? Did they reach out to them? I can't imagine HHMI would have thought that was their responsibility somehow. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was uh, this was a structural genomics initiative. This was uh, 
solving large numbers of protein structures and putting them in the public domain to inform biology. Mm -hmm. In fact, had that not happened, we probably wouldn't have had the, um, as soon, we would have eventually had, but we probably would not have had as quickly the enormous innovation that took place with the application of AI and machine learning to the protein structure prediction challenge by various teams, but ultimately uh, by DeepMind, you know, Google DeepMind that with AlphaFold 2, they chose to compete in that space because the data were so clean in the PDB. Mm. And the data were all organized with, you know, with the proper, or the proper data model, et cetera. It was very easy for them to move into that data set and actually apply their tools, their superior access to computing, project management, talented programmers, and uh, and jump and jump ahead. You know, other groups had shown uh, modicums of success using AI machine learning methods, but it took that sustained effort at DeepMind with the with the PDB data, with the deep genome sequence data that was also available, to make uh, AlphaFold two a reality. And of course, that was very rapidly followed by RosettaFold two and other. Um, uh, OpenFold, they're all all these different uh, competitors now. They're actually doing a better job than AlphaFold. DeepMind's moved on. That was a publicity uh, play for them, uh, and they're now doing they're now doing um, AI structure guided drug discovery. All right, um, we have a, a follow up question on this general topic, which is, um, you know, wh what are the pros and cons of seeking industrial partners? And um, related question is, how do you deal with proprietary data in that context? Um, maybe I can start out on that. It's because this is something that has been from the very beginning um, very much part of the model of CKS. Um, and so I, I personally believe that it's extremely important to um, seek industrial partners less because of funding or because they, they won't for the most part unless you define that value but because it helps you to at least in our space uh to identify the important questions um and so that is the the really the the, the initial step um and then you build on that, and then you can start thinking about, well, how about contributing data? What formats do we have? We don't have any, you know, all 172 uh, ELNs available. So how do you, if you think about data intake, talk with them because they have dealt with it. So the information that they can provide you is more important uh, than, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars of funding. Um, Later on, once you demonstrate value, uh, I still think that that the interactions with industrial partners is um, very valuable, even though I agree with the person asking the question, the um, discussion around intellectual property, what is proprietary, we were joking about that over lunch on, you know, all your data is non-propriety and all of mine is. Um, uh, these are difficult discussions, but, uh, they, they have a, there's a lot of very smart people there and they got a lot to contribute. If you want to have an impact, I consider this essential. Uh, for us on NanoHabit, what, what the partnerships that have made sense, and this is very recent, is, uh, commercial software providers and deploying their tools for educational use on NanoHub because a lot of our students are going to go out and work in industry and, and those are the tools that they're going to uh, need to know. So, uh, and for the longest time, uh, the software providers were completely against sharing any of their tools online through the cloud on, on NanoHub. And over the last maybe three years, that has been a, a, a big change in their attitude towards the cloud and towards enabling students uh, access to to their to their tools and I think that really benefits the community everyone can go to NanoHub now and run MATLAB or a bunch of other commercial codes engineering codes and TCAT codes uh, for free for education professors can use it without 
having to download or install the software, which is quite difficult. Probably part of that is also that the industry as a whole went from, you know, you buy a software to you rent a software model. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would just add, uh, Jake, that at, at NIST, we have a lot of uh, cooperative, cooperative research and development agreements with private industry, which um, after, a, I think it's typically a five-year period, any data collected under that CRADA is obligated to become public. Um, but what that brings to light is that this move toward fair data management is just as important in industry as it is in the public sector and university research sector. Um, I was talking recently with a colleague from ExxonMobil who talked about challenges they have within their company in managing data. Different divisions do things in different ways. They acquire another company which has a different data management philosophy, different data formats. None of them are interoperable. Nobody knows what the other group has, and now they're all expected to work together and build an integrated system. So. These fair data principles and everything we're talking about here in terms of improving data management are just as critical, if not more, for you know the profit-making private sector. Stephen. <clears throat> there are as many protein structures in, in total distributed among the top 20 pharmaceutical companies as there are structures in the PDB. I would love it if the pharmaceutical company would dump 200,000 structures on me tomorrow. I don't know how I would manage it, but it would be a huge step forward because we would have 3D structures of many examples of same protein, different small chemicals bound. That would accelerate the um, a computational chemistry in ways that are simply not possible at the moment. Uh, We've, we've had small projects with industry to do that, and uh, I would be very receptive to a much larger project, but that hasn't happened yet. Bring it back, Donnie. <laughs> yeah. tell, tell them. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So Danny Schultz, um, I'm at Merck, and um, this has been really enlightening. And it, the question that you just asked, Jake, kind of was one that I was going to lead with, and that I think the industrial sector as a whole is really interested in collaborating and innovating beyond our walls, because we know um, that the power that it can have, and I think Olaf brought up a wonderful point, the problem selection and um, is really critical there because it leads to um, really great applied sciences. And so I guess my question is, um, are there specific strategies or initiatives that industry can start to take on or contribute to, to advance fair data practices? besides dumping 200,000 um, <laughs> protein structures into a database? Yeah, so uh, in the last 12 months, roughly, we uh, initiated a, a number of discussions, um, both in Europe and the US, uh, with various roundtables there. And kind of what are the right questions, or what are the questions that a company will never allow beyond their own walls versus, um, you know, things that are best done cooperatively. And so um, to summarize in, in a grossly simplified fashion, tools and methods um, and validation are things that are probably done beyond, better done beyond your walls because the, particularly the validation part, once you go out of your, your own ecosystem, does it still work? And so organizations like CCAS or NanoHub can play the role of an honest broker, if you will, in that context, in, in, in providing a, a neutral marketplace to discuss these, these different approaches. So I think those are areas which work exceedingly well. Once you get down to um, specific problems, I need an inhibitor for that protein. Well, you don't even want to know anybody else know that you're working on this target, right? Um, and so that's when it's maybe how do you apply these tools to a particular question? That's probably not as well done. Uh, I, I would second that. I think um, identifying pre-competitive research areas where the data can be shared 
and it's co-funded. Uh, I think the, the semiconductor uh, industry does this very well. There's an organization called SRC. They fund a lot of uh, academic work at a pre-competitive level and lots of companies uh, chip in and they're, they're, they work together and they establish as a community where they, they want to go, what their priorities, and it helps uh, having uh, stronger ties between academia and industry. And the second thing I would say is workforce development, okay? The, the, the main thing we generate is not the research, is the students who actually do the research and then they go out. So I think having uh, the uh, appreciating and hiring students that are expected to be uh, knowledgeable about data, knowledgeable about, about fair data. It's something that can then be fed back to our institutions and push the need to change how we educate our students. There has to be a clear need uh, from companies so that universities can update the way we teach and and produce the the the, the students with the education that is needed for modern uh, chemistry and material science. Considering it, the data in patents that are not peer reviewed, how reliable and trustworthy those data are for prediction for using in the AI slash ML algorithms. As usual, the answer is a strong, it depends. Um, so yes, they are not peer reviewed, but they are reviewed because there is a, you know, a big stick there in saying that your patent can potentially be invalidated if what's in there is not correct. Um, potentially that is a big caveat there. Um, there is a lot of inconsistency there. Um, and so um, what we find in analyzing the PTO is uh, that you can filter a lot of that out uh, by, by looking for internal consist inconsistencies. Um, so once you've gone through this, um, I would say probably upwards of 80% is what I would consider reasonably reliable. And then the other 20% you will have to filter out. So I'm glad you talked about reproducibility. The dirty little secret of NIH-funded biological research in this country is that 50% of publications cannot be reproduced. The patent literature, I believe, as you do, is much more reliable because in companies, results have to be consistent. The assay can't be run three times and you choose the data point you like and move on and try and get a paper. That assay has to work every time it's 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 conducted in the in, in the company. Now, I'm not saying that 50% of the papers in you know that are published with NIH money are the result of fraud. I don't believe that they are. A small number to be sure, but I think it's a very small number. I think the problem with trying to do research in biology is best exemplified by thinking about what happens to a cell that's in a tissue culture plate. The genome of that cell today will be different tomorrow, and that genome will be different the next day because these, pro these cells that are living on tissue culture are constantly evolving under the selection pressure of having to survive in that environment. And so doing controlled experiments in biology is just really hard. Uh, and it's, so it's not surprising that there's this variation in in NIH funded research. Um, I think protein crystallography, NMR spectroscopy, electron microscopy are among the most reproducible of the of the biological sciences today. And, so, and part of that is the PDB and the data validation, the data the data consistency, et cetera. There's a there was a question on the chat. Um, asking about the distinction between what's reported in the paper and what's actually stored in the repositories. And in the PDB, certainly, there's much more data concerning 
the experimental system in the PDB typically than there is in the publication. So if you want to be able to reproduce something, you're frequently better off going to the archive and not to the literature. So a few years ago, my colleague Ann Plant at NIST and I wrote up a paper on reproducibility challenges. And uh, as you say, it's it's very rarely fraud. It's very rarely uh, intentional uh, corruption of data, but it's, uh, especially in, in biology, it's the unknown unknowns. There are environmental parameters in laboratories that can change from time to time, the temperature, humidity, the reagent maybe is not what you ordered from the supplier. It has, and, and the, the mouse line is not what you were told it was and, and so forth. So um, there, there's just many things that can go on that you don't, you're not aware of affecting your experiment. And my, my uh, colleague, Baron Mons in, in the Netherlands talked about going to a lab. I think it was in, maybe it was in Argentina. I don't know, but um, where they were having great trouble reproducing some experiment based on on cells they couldn't figure out what was what was going on so he went down there and he looked over their shoulder and uh, they were smoking in in the laboratory <laughs> and blowing their cigarette smoke onto their samples it's, well you've got to stop smoking <laughs> All right, um, we're nearing the end of our time. I wanna ask uh, what's hopefully a quick question and then then we'll go on to the wrap up. Um, maybe Ali, you can weigh in on this. There was a sort of general question on the chat about where GitHub fits into the um, repository ecosystem. And um, I'm curious what, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, well, uh, I, I think GitHub has or, or any type of version control system has a huge role to play. Uh, what I think is, what, what I think is that that's not the end of reproducibility and sharing and fair is putting your stuff on a Git repository for the reasons that I mentioned. So when you deploy a tool on NanoHub, the code is on a Git repository and we use version control. Uh, but what's deployed and what's published is a containerized version of that piece of code that has all the environment and uh, the, the settings so that it can actually run reproducibly uh, uh, all the packages, all the libraries that are needed. So it, it will always run the same way. So I think Git is not... Um, uh, th these are complementary uh, infrastructures, and and of course, putting things on Git is better than putting things that that not sharing, or putting them in your website as a tarball. Uh, but it's it's not going to be discoverable. It's not going to be queryable um, uh, to to a certain degree, and it's not necessarily going to be uh, reproducible uh, without the right environment if it's uh, code. So ditto for the Protein Data Bank. We maintain GitHub repositories for both the code and for the data model, for the data dictionary. So all that's publicly available. Yeah. I think one of the parts that, um, to address some of the, the problems that Ali was mentioning is, I think it's not enough uh, to deposit the code. You also have to put a test suite that you know, if you run this, you're supposed to get these answers here. Because the worst thing that can happen is that you run this on a different machine, different environment, and you're not aware that something changed. All right. So um, we will uh, just about wrap up the panel. I think this was a terrific discussion. And um, I just want to end by reflecting on the fact that, you know, we're in Washington, D.C. This is where... Um, People set the budgets. And, um, you know, I, I'd like to be optimistic that, um, you know, as, as I said multiple times when we were planning this workshop, that open data in particular is not going to be an unfunded mandate. And so, um, you know, I think most, if not all of us here, are, are U.S. citizens. Um, so I'm curious, you know, what, what can we do? How, how can we advocate for this? How can we, as citizens, as scientists and as you know interested parties 
how can we help ensure that open data is is actually achieved and and is sustained um, from the perspective of talking to policymakers and um, you know helping them understand the urgency? The community has to speak. Um, as I said, I've been trying to you know encourage these changes for decades uh, with very little success, I'm afraid. Um, you know, when I talk to my colleagues at, at the National Science Foundation, they say, well, we need to hear this from the community. Uh, we won't just impose this and we won't dock their budgets two or three percent to do this unless they demand it. So the community has to understand. They have to understand the value proposition that I think is very clear to the people in this room, but they have to hear that as, as a groundswell. And uh, my experience in astronomy is that uh, if, if NASA stopped funding these discipline data centers, NASA headquarters would be stormed with a riot. You know, <laughs> That's the kind of, of groundswell that I think is needed. Until then, we'll keep talking the right talk and hoping for change, but it will happen a lot faster if the research community uh, demands it. Um, maybe as a first disclosure, I'm actually not the US citizen here, but anyway, uh, I think uh, Stephen made a very important point earlier. There are times in history when um, you can demonstrate the necessity for that in a unique fashion. And as you said, there was one of those. Um, I think one of the parts why uh, CCAS is, is doing really well is right now, because simply everybody's talking about machine learning or AI, if you prefer that term. And the community needs to be prepared to say, at that point you're asked, and, and some of the members of CCAS have gone back and forth between uh, their universities and Washington many, many, many times in the last six months because there is a major AI freakout going on. And those are the points where you really can say, look, in order to do this right and not get wiped out, here are the steps that we need to take. I, I think we need to continue to talk to our representatives and advocate for science. I think we also need to learn how to talk to the general public. And I think we do a pretty bad job at that. Uh, Purdue is a land grant institution, right? So we serve the people of Indiana and the nation. And I don't think we have um, good avenues to communicate and to tell our story and uh, more than the avenues, we don't have the right language to communicate with the general public. I think we do a poor job uh, talking to folks who are not geeks like us and to be able to see a little bit outside of our uh, community. And I think that would be important to have an educated uh, educated citizens to make their, 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 take this into consideration when they go to vote. Uh, so I, I think we can learn from others, learn from other fields. We we have amazing communicators, you know, Carl Sagan, uh, Dick Feynman, who actually went outside. They were not just talking to their uh, colleagues, right? They were talking to people. I think we need more advocates like that for science. In all fairness, there's some great people in chemistry. I mean, there's somebody here uh, in DC, actually, Rachelle Burks, who is just fabulous in this. Um, Andre Isaacs uh, up at Holy Cross. Uh, we have people like this. And whatever we can do to give them a platform and get the word out will achieve exactly that. All right, Stephen, last word. I agree with Alejandro. Science communication is going to be the key. Getting training students to be able to talk about science in ways that people find accessible is uh, is essential for the long term viability of of the scientific enterprise in America. And we and I agree with you. We do a terrible job right now.
All right. Um, that was a slightly pessimistic last word, but um, let, let, let me just say that let we have the let prospect me, of let, doing let a say, less terrible job let, going let, forward. Let me say, let me say <laughs> that I think the problem is surmountable. Right. But we have to make the decision that we're going to reward students for going the extra mile, reward assistant professors, or re reward professors for going the extra mile to do the communication. That, Elaine, you talked about the need to completely revamp the value system within <laughs> universities, what it takes to get tenure, yeah, et cetera, what it takes to get promoted. This is all, I think this is all part and part of the same issue. It's not bury your head in the papers and publish as many minimal publishable units as you possibly can to to meet some sort of scale weight weight of paper test to get uh, to get promoted. It's uh, it's it's the impact that that the work has, and it's the impact the individuals have that should be rewarded. And we can do it. We can do it. All right. Thank you so much. We're going to take a quick 10 minute break and then we'll come back and have a wrap up and give you a preview of what's coming tomorrow morning.